glädjer den här. Ja, här kommer den. Mm, bra. Så finns det två. Så. Varmt välkomna allihopa till Forum för levande historia och också till er som följer oss digitalt. Som ni vet så kommer samtalet härifrån att hållas på engelska. Så, so, welcome to the Living History Forum to all of you here and also everyone following us online. And a special welcome to Professor Deborah Dwork. Uh, it's a real honor and pleasure to have you here tonight. Uh, my name is Petra Marcellius, and I am the Director General of the Living History Forum. Tonight, we will have the opportunity to listen to a presentation by Professor Dwork, followed by a conversation between her and Johan Perve uh, of the Living History Forum. And hopefully, uh, uh, um, at the end, uh, there will be time for a few questions. Before we jump straight into the program, um, just let me say a few words uh, about the Living History Forum for those of you who might not know us all that well. We are a government agency tasked with uh, promoting work for democracy and human rights. Uh, this is something we do, taking departure uh, in lessons learned uh, from the history of the Holocaust and other crimes against humanity. We work with uh, education and training of uh, uh, teachers, uh, pupils, civil servants and others. Uh, we carry out and publish studies on, for example, anti-Semitism and other forms of racism. Uh, we produce different materials for the classroom. Uh, we carry out trips to Holocaust memorial sites uh, and produce uh, uh, exhibitions, among many other things. We, you find us here in our offices and our exhibitions in Stockholm, but we work all over the country. One of our uh, important assignments uh, from the Swedish government is to commemorate Holocaust Memorial Day every year, the 27th of January. Uh, and this seminar is part of our activities uh, connected with Holocaust Memorial Day. We also promote uh, local activities to commemorate uh, uh, the Holocaust Day by, for instance, providing local actors such as museums, schools, uh, municipalities, uh, libraries uh, with um, uh, a yearly exhibition which is uh, possible to print and use and display free of charge. Uh, you will find this year's exhibition with the theme uh, Children During the Holocaust uh, uh, above the stairs here uh, and that is of course also the topic of the conversation uh, this evening. We're living in very dark times in the world at the moment and we have ongoing conflicts affecting many people, not least many children. And it's, it's unbearable to think about the suffering and loss of life while we sit here. When we move on to talk about the 1.5 million children who perished during the Holocaust tonight, it's with utmost respect and sympathy for all the victims of conflicts and wars today, of course, today and in the past. Now, please let me introduce uh, Professor uh, Dwork and Johan Pereve. 
Deborah Dwork uh, is the director of the Center for uh, the Study of Holocaust, Genocide and Crimes uh, Against Humanity at the Graduate Center uh, of the U City University uh, of New York. She's an internationally renowned researcher on Holocaust history and a leading authority on university education uh, and is uh, very committed to training the next generation of Holocaust scholars, for which we're very grateful. Uh, she was one of the first historians uh, to record Holocaust survivors' oral histories and to use their narratives to explore the social and cultural history of the Holocaust. Professor Dwork also introduced a new child-centered approach to Holocaust research. Writer of several books, uh, award mem mem winning member of several boards, uh, the list is very long. Uh, you're truly remarkable. We're very, very grateful that you're here with us tonight. Johan Perve uh, is a long-term member of the staff here at the Living History Forum, works as a press officer uh, currently. Johan is also a writer and researcher specialized on Swedish-German relations, uh, Nazism and resistance during the 1930s and the Holocaust. Johan, Professor Dwork, the stage is yours. Okay. I have thanks of my own to extend. I have thanks of my own to extend. I thank each and every person who is here physically for coming out in the dark to hear and to participate. And I thank everyone who is participating through Zoom. Teams, through teams, yes. How wonderful that we have this ability to reach out and communicate in this way. I thank my hosts here at the Living History Forum now to gossip about them behind their backs. They are the most wonderful hosts in the world, taking, attend taking care with every single detail and I appreciate your warmth, your hospitality, and your good sense. And finally, I would like to thank my great friend, Robert Weil, who, su who supported my research when I was young once. You mentioned, Petra, that I record the oral histories of now elderly child survivors. I began to do this decades ago, and Robert supported that work here in Sweden. So, so much of what I have done has been on the back of his generosity. So I thank you. Um, now, to the business at hand. You will have seen on your seats that there is a list of terms. Please take them out. You will see that most of them are, are names that are not of historical importance, but they will be names that are unfamiliar to you. And if you are, like I am, and a name floats past you and doesn't quite lodge in your ear, you'll turn to the person next to you and say, What'd she say? So this is to help you know what she said. The second thing is that I will speak for 25 minutes, plus minus 10%, depending upon how often I breathe. But if you're wondering what is going on with this woman, take a look at the list of terms, see where we are, and pace yourself till the end. <laughs> the good news is there is no final exam. 
And now I begin. We know that 90% of all European Jewish children alive in 1939 who came under Nazi Germany and its allies, that of those, nearly 1.5 million children died or were killed by war's end. Death is always in view. The question that we will address this evening is, how did youngsters navigate life? Let's start at the beginning. For a time after the Nazis came to power or the Germans invaded a country, Jewish children continued to live as they had done before, at home with their families. But their lives changed. First, Jewish children were thrown out of public school. This shattered their world. Mariella Piperno, I think she's the first one on your list. Okay. Remembered her shock and shame when Mussolini's fascist government passed the race laws and she was no longer permitted to go to public school. I was ashamed, ashamed to tell my friends that I could not go to school because I am a Jewish girl. Edict followed edict. The world the children inhabited continued to shrink, restricted access to public transportation, then none at all. Short shopping hours late in the day when the shelves were bare, an imposed curfew. Playgrounds, swimming pools, cinemas, all forbidden. Still, the children carried on, and adults helped them to do so within that tightened sphere. Indeed, for some children, the new circumstances led to greater freedom. Berthe Bloch, about nine at the time and living in the Netherlands, delighted in a new activity her parents had forbidden before, sleepovers. Now that she could not go home after curfew, her parents allowed her to sleep at a friend's house. Of course, life under the Germans was not a sleepover. It was restriction after restriction until the moment came when Jews were not allowed to live in their homes at all, the moment of departure into a ghetto, into hiding into a transit camp. The Germans invaded Poland in September 1939. By May 1940, a ghetto was established in Lodz. Warsaw followed in November. Ghetto inmates battled over crowding, disease, destitution, hunger. And still, schooling continued. After the Germans attacked the Soviet Union in June 1941, they again established ghettos. Kovno, with its 35,000 strong Jewish community the very next month. It was in July, too, that Jews were marked with the star front and back, and five days later were ordered into the ghetto. All schools were closed, reopened, closed again, reopened, then forbidden anew. In Kovno, a group of devoted teachers succeeded in opening a vocational school for older children, and it became a center for cultural life in the ghetto. Activity abounded, literary readings, lectures about literature, a choir with 100 singers, a lending library, a drama circle. Each time the Germans took away new victims, the remaining teachers and students renewed their classes. And the children appreciated it, wanted it, longed for it. Schooling and youth activities are one part of the story. 
hunger, disease, deportation, death are another. The Germans and their allies in the east of Europe had begun to kill Jews en masse in the fall of 1941. In spring 1942, Berlin made an important decision. Western Europe's Jews would be sent east. This meant the Jews had to be moved long distances. In the Soviet Union, Einsatzgruppen killed Jews on the spot. There was no need to collect and ship people to annihilation centers. In Poland, ghettos served as storage pens, and the distances to the camps was short. But there were no closed ghettos in the West, and Jews had long been integrated into society. Cattle cars in the central station would not do. So the Germans sent Jews by third class rail to a transit camp within the country, and thence east. Theresienstadt served as one such transit camp. Choosing the fortified ghetto, garrison town of Terezin to serve as a Jewish settlement or old people's ghetto, the Germans evacuated the town's 3,700 inhabitants. Train loads of Jews rolled in. And shortly thereafter, train loads of Jews rolled out, each filled with 1,000 people sent to an unknown destination. Oddly enough, the concept of Terezin as a model ghetto affected the inmates, too. Despite constant threat of deportation, lack of food and hygiene, and omnipresent disease, the Jews created an intellectual and cultural life for adults and children. Children accounted for about 10% of the population of Theresienstadt. The Germans took little notice of them, leaving their governance to the Council of Elders. The council established a youth welfare department to safeguard the children's health and continue their education despite the Germans' prohibitions. To those ends, the Jewish administrators supported the policy of instituting separate children's homes. Beginning in mid-1942, the majority of children over the age of four were placed in a kinderheim. At that time, many of the Jewish leaders were Zionists, and they had the idea that this collective life would help to instill the values of Zionism while protecting children from the worst of life at Terezin. Many of the child welfare workers, the Betreuerinnen and Betreuerinnen in the homes were devoted to fostering education. For them, as for the children, it was an act of faith in the future. About a week after Helga Polak arrived in Theresienstadt, she was moved into room 28 of L410 house number 10 on the fourth lengthwise street, the Czech children's home for girls aged 10 to 16. As Helga understood it, the purpose of the home, and I'm quoting from her now, was to take the children away from their parents so that the children shouldn't see all the suffering and trouble of the grown-ups. The children, were organized to lead a child's life. The moment you lead this child's life, especially supported as such wonderful people supported us, the rest 
goes into the background, she recalled. As in many other children's homes in Theresienstadt, and again I'm quoting, everything which had to do with Palestine was looked upon as something fantastic, and something everybody wanted to do was to go there and be in a kibbutz. Unique to room 28, however, was that we had a parliament, we had an emblem, we had a hymn which we sang, and we had a uniform which we wore only at festivities. The Jewish Council of Elders established a cultural department, and music, art, and theater became part of the life of Theresienstadt. Children attended these performances, and performances put on especially for them. And the young people themselves participated in these ventures. These educational and cultural activities, wonderful and exciting as they were, were exceptional events in the ordinarily dreary and dismal days in a transit camp. And in the end, nearly all the children in Theresienstadt left in cattle cars bound for the east. As Helga told her father in despair, on a slip of paper, a person's destiny is decided. How to avoid deportation? That was a key question for Jews across Europe. Chaim Rumkowski, the elder of the Lodz ghetto, thought that he could keep the Jews alive if he transformed the population into a workforce needed by the Germans. But what of those too young or too old to work? September 1942, those who were employed were not marked for deportation, but for children under the age of 10 and adults over 65, there was no mercy. Sarah Grossman Weil was there. In 1942, there was a general Sperre, an important selection. We were warned not to go out from our homes. When they came to our building, we all walked out. We all lined up in our courtyard, the men, the women, the young, and the elderly. And the children were taken away. We had to line them up, since there was such a cadre of SS men. They had enough SS men to go into every room to see whether there is anyone hiding or anyone left behind. We had all the children out, 12, 13, 10 years old, 8 years old. The children were taken away, thrown, literally thrown onto the wagon. And when the mother objected, either she was taken with them or shot. Or they tore the child away from her and pushed her to the side. And all the children, small children, little ones, five, six, four, seven years old, were thrown, literally thrown into this wagon. The cries were reaching the sky, but there was no help. There was no one to turn to, to plead your case, to beg. Ultimately, as we know, everyone was deported. All the ghettos were liquidated. The timing differed in each, but the pattern held. Establishment, deportation actions, final liquidation. The Germans invaded Hungary with its last surviving major European Jewish community in spring 1944. Together with their willing Hungarian allies, and despite the lack of trains, wartime conditions, and the advance of the Soviet army, they deported 450,000 Jews in less than two months. 
On May 16, 1944, the Hungarian gendarmes ousted 13-year-old Maria Elsner, her eight-and-a-half-year-old sister, and their mother from their home in Abad Solok on the Hungarian plain. The Jews of Abad Salok were driven to the larger town of Kunhedesh, about 12 kilometers to the south, where they were incarcerated in a ghetto. The ghetto was guarded by Hungarian gendarmes, no Germans, and for Maria. No one could go in or out. We had no bread. We had a hunger you cannot imagine. We had nothing to eat in the ghetto. We had nothing. We had nothing to eat. But we were happy among us children. We didn't have to pretend anymore that we were for the glory of the German army. We could take off our masks. We were Jewish children, and among ourselves we could say, down with Hitler. The children of Kunhegesh endured the hunger and enjoyed the freedom for a month. On the 16th of June, again from Maria Elsner, the gendarmes came and told us that in two hours we had to be ready to leave. Before they went on transport, however, the Jews in the Hungarian short-term ghettos were robbed. We were taken to a great empty field, and everybody had to sit with his baggage, and the gendarmes came to see what we had with us. We stood there in this empty field, every family with its baggage. We stood there on the empty field, and my mother's handbag was taken, and she cried out, our papers, our personal papers. And then the gendarme opened her handbag and ripped our personal papers. And the text was, you won't need them anymore. And then we were beaten. A little house stood at the end of this field. We didn't take notice of it. Then we heard names being called of people who had to go to this house. In the house sat several civilian men. They were detectives, and they asked us where we had hidden our gold, silver, porcelain, and whatever, and who were our Christian friends to whom we had given our valuables. My mother was beaten on the soles of her feet with rubber truncheons. Afterwards, she could not walk. I was slapped on my face and asked, because I was old enough, I must have helped hide the valuables. Then they sent me to a midwife. That was miserable. The midwives examined women and young girls. Maybe they had something in their vaginas, a gold ring or so. Thank you, Lena. I had never seen such a table or such a chair. My mother had to lie on it, and she was examined. Then I was examined, and my mother cried, take care, she is a child, and I don't know what I thought of those women. Late in the evening, the Jews of Konhegesh were ordered to board the train wagons. Deportation. We will return to these people, the deported Jewish children. For just a moment, however, let us turn to those who managed to elude deportation, to those who with luck and through fortuitous circumstances, were able to hide. Unlike Anna Frank's family, most Jewish families who went into hiding separated. It was difficult to hide one person, let alone two or three or four or more. And most children did not stay in one place. 
Constant danger meant no stability, and the children changed homes many times. 30 or 40 addresses was not uncommon. Hiding was no sinecure. Betrayal always loomed. Sarah Speer and her sister were taken from their home in Arnhem to two sets, two separate sets of people. Their parents and baby brother went together to yet another family. The parents and the little boy were betrayed by neighbors who argued with the host family over clothespins to hang washing. They got into a quarrel, and then the neighbor said, well, now I go to the police and tell that you have Jews. They didn't believe he would, but he did. And thus we return to the deported Jews. It is here that usually we lose sight of these human beings as people. We can see them clearly at home, in ghetto, in hiding. But most people's imagination fails them when these same Jews are locked into cattle cars. Let us hold on. Let us follow them into the death camp. Let us accompany them at the safe distance of 80 years into Auschwitz. Auschwitz was a death factory and the hugest labor exchange in Europe at the time. Some young people were seen as able to work, and Mengele and his men let them through. Andras Garzo, 12 and a half and deported with his father from Debrecen in Hungary, was one. Andras and other boys were sent to one barrack, their fathers to another. The first night, the fathers came to their sons, he recalled. Contact between the two barracks was forbidden, but the situation was so harsh that our fathers came to sleep with us to try to comfort us a little. The Germans came and began to scream that everybody should stand up, and our fathers had to bear their buttocks and to bend over the brick heating tunnel which ran down the center of the room. They were beaten so they wouldn't come again. And they didn't come again. It isn't that life goes on. It's that people go on living. And living continued until the final moment of death or liberation. Each child, every day. Thank you very much. That's it. Thank you very much, Deborah, for a thoughtful and empathetic presentation. And thank you for your attention to it. Before I start uh, our little talk here, I just wanted to explain a little about our um, <clears throat> exhibition upstairs, in short term. Um, every year at this time, during um, the Holocaust Remembrance Day, we at the Living History Forum um, produces and offers an exhibition uh, that can be printed out um, and, and, and shows at uh, libraries and other institutions. And this year it's uh, the theme, uh, Children During Holocaust, and uh, um, with particular focus on those children that were affected and, and, and uh, uh, exposed. And it's centered around 10 lives, and um, uh, it highlights on, on uh, discrimination, racism, loss and suffering that the children experienced during the Holocaust. And we um, um, base these uh, 
uh, they are based on testimonies from the children uh, who survived because they were they lived to tell, uh, as you mentioned, and and uh, um, most of the murdered children, um, uh, unnamed, unknown, have, have we never heard their voices? We have never heard. Uh, Yet we have some uh, voices included upstairs, um, and um, the important purpose with this exhibition, um, of course, increasing knowledge, uh, um, is also to to uh, um, um, focus on children, Roma and Jewish children that were that were affected during the Holocaust, and and um, we hope that this exhibition will be. Um, uh, spreading among young people uh, that they can, um, because you can see it upstairs, but you can also see it on the web, and you can um, um, further further it, the knowledge of it in social media. And so, also the exhibition is on display here in Stockholm at the uh, Raoul Wallenberg Torg um, during the Memorial Day. It's, you can already you can see it already now. To start the little talk now, um, of course, I have, I'm have. i very interested in, in why you became a historian in the first place. What was, um, what was it that made it? Was it some subject or was it the history uh, as a subject? Or was it like a theme or something that you, you um, got affected by? I, w I appreciate the question very much. But you've said something that was really important that I would like to address, not to lose. So again, if your memory is like my memory, you mm. jump on something when you remember it. And that is that I am so appreciative of your exhibition and of the fact that you have included Roma and Sinti children as well. The, our, our understanding of the genocide perpetrated against the Roma and Sinti have, has really changed over the past decades. And I do know, well, my colleague Stefan Bruchfeld asked me about a book, what would I change if I could write it again? And with Children with a Star, one of the things I would change is that I would pay, I would research what happened to Roma and Sinti children in the same way as I researched what happened to Jewish children. So this was, um, so mm. thank you. Thank you for having done this work. And now I'll answer about being a historian. Okay. <laughs> um, I actually don't know why I became a historian, and that's the truth. I can't say that I woke up one morning and said, oh, I'm going to be a historian. I somehow backed into it, and there I was, a historian. And, and the subject children uh, of the Holocaust, um, was there some, some, what made you into that uh, line or field of scholarship? There are, there are real reasons for that. I don't know which of them is the true reason, but I do know that there are a couple. So here I am, a historian. And I was a historian, a modern European historian. So there are many subjects I could have worked on. I could have worked on, for example, the Enlightenment and the French Revolution, or the Enlightenment. I'm an Enlightenment kind of person. I really think that the whole Enlightenment project has a lot to offer us, especially my country, especially now. It's not by accident that I ended up working on Jewish children. My mother's oldest sister is the only member of the family that was still in Europe at the time, to have survived. And when I grew up, my aunt, 
whom I loved, told me stories, not horror stories, stories about love and rel mutual reliance. And I realized that the stories that my aunt told were not, when I became a historian, I realized that the stories that my aunt told were not in history books. That there was the diary of Anna Frank, and that was it. There, was no, there were no other explorations at that time of Jewish child life. When I was a graduate student, my closest colleague is another historian named Robert Jan van Pelt, brilliant historian, does a lot of work on Auschwitz. His mother was in, was in semi-hiding in Amsterdam during the war. And one time, I was together with his mother, Judy, and she said, did I ever tell you about how I was the person in the family who scavenged for food during the occupation? And I said, no, Judy, you didn't ever happen to mention how you were the person who's. And she said, yes, you know, I was a young girl. And because I was so malnourished, I looked even younger. So I didn't attract the Germans' attention. And she said, you know where to find food? I said, no, I don't, actually. And she said, in the rubbish bins of hospitals. Again, I realized that this was information that I didn't read anywhere in any histories. And so I thought, well, OK, I'll do that. I'll be the person who writes that book. Interesting. Mary, you are the director of the Center of the Study of the Holocaust, Genocide, and Crime Against Humanity, a very, very long um, uh, um, title. But um, what kind of subjects do you teach there? And um, um, possibly uh, what is most appealing among the students in New York right now? Which, which um, choices do they make? What, which subjects do they are the most interested in uh, within your institution? If it's possible to to to, to give an answer on, on that, I will just broaden it to this institution and to the Strassler Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies at Clark University, which I used to direct only because it opens the window, and also because I started as director of this center right when COVID hit. So I don't feel that I have the same kind of track record. And what I would say in general, looking at both institutions from a very, from, from an airplane level looking down, so sky high, I would say that there has been a move towards specific groups. Um, Yeah, social history has gained traction. Um, studies of women during the Holocaust, interest in the Roma and Sinti, interest in the Armenian genocide, interest in genocide in different political and cultural contexts. So not a narrow lens, but a rather wider lens. As you mentioned, we've heard of, well, everyone's heard of Anne Frank. And um, um, in our exhibition, we didn't include her. Uh, we have told of her many times before in other exhibitions and other material uh, towards schools. Um, but as I know, there were many other children who who did uh, go into hiding, as you mentioned in your in your presentation, um, and were able 
also to manage to, to survive. Um, is there possible to, to, to mention any qualities or circumstances that made it, uh, uh, that made it for, for them to go into hiding? Or are there any um, um, qualities that the children had or the uh, circumstances that you can point out that um, made it possible for them to go into hiding? One piece, I would not, I, there's no set pattern. One cannot say if you had enough money, if you had this, if you had that. So there is no set pattern, but certainly a wide social network, no matter what the social class. So the idea that I have confronted, the prejudice that I have confronted often is that People assume that it took money to go into hiding. And my response is, no, it took friends to go into hiding. And those, it could be that somebody who was, for example, a tailor or a cobbler, a shoemaker, shoe repair person, um, had a wide social network from the clientele. Even if the personal life was restricted. But certainly that social networks loom large. And um, you could think um, or you have, to, with the fa you have the facts on hand that many more should have gone into hiding, and, um, except friends. Well, why were there so few going into hiding? Is, could you elaborate around that? Or? Imagine, you, we talk about going into hiding as if it were something easy, or, uh, or that the outcome would be certain. But imagine if you were a parent at that time. Imagine letting go of your child, sending that child to live with people you might not even know, but who came recommended through, as I say, this social network. And not knowing not only how these people would be towards your children, but not knowing what the outcome would be. Would, my, would, the, would that situation get burned, as it was mm. called at the time? And if it did, who would be there for your child? So I think the first and most difficult step of all in the whole chain of hiding was parental letting go of their children. Mm. It's an impossible thing. Aside from that, there are, of course, many other factors like isolation in the countryside versus an urban situation. Both pose challenges. Each situation has its own risks. Um, I also urge us to think very seriously about luck, fortuitous circumstance, timing, emotional relationships. All of these also played a factor in the decision to go into hiding and the situation once in hiding. Um, except the diary of Anna Frank, uh are there more written accounts from the children in hiding that we don't know of, or do you recommend any of, of uh, the writings and books? Yes, there are many. Um, I wouldn't say diaries. There are there are some diaries. Not there are not many diaries written by children in hiding, um, but there are test testimonies. So there's a. Canadian foundation called the Azrieli Foundation, and they publish the test the memoirs of 
survivors who ended up in Canada, because they are a Canadian. And amongst those, there are many that are very powerful of the hiding experience. Thank you. Um, well, the children who survived, um, uh, often they had to continue their lives uh, without the security of their family, the previous roots and the culture. Um, everything that was important to value to them, uh, they, they was lost for them. Uh, it's a difficult, it's a big question, but how did these experiences and losses affect uh, the children as grown-ups, as adults? Is it, is it possible to, to, um, to give some examples on how to coping? While I mull that question, I wonder if you would like to address the issue of hiding. Because if I understand mm. correctly, your grandfather was a hider. Oh, it's correct, yes. He was a um, Swedish vicar in, at the Victoria Gemeinde in Berlin during the 40s, 42 to 44, and he um, um, managed to, to hide uh, within uh, the congregation, uh, Jews and political uh, ref refugees. Um, and um, so I have uh, also battled the around you know the timing and, and uh, the possibility of actions uh, and, and when you when you can't act and and when it's too dangerous f all these different um, um, decision that they had to make uh, in, in a swift of a moment um, so um, I'm really looking forward to your coming upcoming book that where you really are trying to, to um, lift up the circumstances and, and, and luck and, and timing. and, and um, It's coming this year, isn't it? Um, yeah, so I have a new book which, which is scheduled for publication in January 2025. So already, I, I find it amazing that the presses are reserved a year out. <laughs> but so it is. And it's called Saints and Liars. It's about American relief and rescue workers. And what I undertake to show is the role of the unpredictable luck, timing, fortuitous circumstances, the weather, and how those affected and shaped lives. So the unpredictable and the irrational. Think about the most important decisions in your lives, like, for example, your choice of partner. Why did you choose your partner? I don't know. <clears throat> and yet, when we think about the past, we erase the irrational. So as I'm hearing Johan talk about his grandfather, I'm wondering, were there more people who sought his grandfather's help than his grandfather could help. Mm. And if there were, how did his grandfather choose? That was a good question. I've, I've pondered upon that many times. And I, um, you can also say that my grandfather uh, was starting an action to so save 20 22 um, Jews and political refugees in the end of 44, but the plane, the airplane from Berlin to Stockholm was shut down and he died. So many of them never got rescued. So that's circumstance. That's something that happened. And, and uh, um, of course, then I never met him and I never could state the question to him. But um, also, the, there's, there's, he has his diary that I've, you know, with short. Uh, uh, small entries, and, and and you can you can tell that things happening all the time, and you have to you have to manage, and you have to decide in the blink of a moment. And um, really looking forward to your book. Um, it's going to be interesting. Thank you. Um, and for this other question that I, I uh, stated, um, um, how 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 they how could they rebuild their lives after after the Holocaust, and how? Did they did they give any did they give any um, 
um, also taken care of? Was someone taken care of the children when they survived off and, and, and tried to rebuild their lives? Um, so the circumstances that children faced after the war, after their experience of the Holocaust, uh, differed from country to, to country. So for example, in the Netherlands, more psychological help was available, offered, and taken, accepted. It wasn't great. Trust me, it wasn't great. But more was available than, for example, in France or Belgium. So the circumstances that children faced um, differed from country to country. But in general, the idea was the message that children received was, don't think about it, put it behind you, move forward. But they couldn't, of course. So they lived life on many levels. On the one hand, doing exactly that, moving forward. And most child survivors went on to have fruitful, productive, and loving lives. And at the same time, not but, and at the same time, carried pain, trepidations, and worries with them. Thank you. Um, I mentioned my grandfather's diary, and I was thinking about other archiv arch archival documents and uh, how difficult it is for these documents to tell the story of the children that survived or the children that died. And oral history is, is the key, and that's the way you have uh, uh, <clears throat> um, accomplished um, knowledge of traumatic experiences, families broken apart, and, 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 and trying to, to uh, tell the stories um, um, of these people uh, that, that now are grown up. Uh, but have you, do you ever think about if it's a reliable uh, uh, um, witness? As so there's so many years after they, uh, no disrespect, but so many years later, they, what they are telling, um, would you, how do you, it's, it's kind of like a methodological uh, problem. So there are, a couple of, there are a couple of things I would want to say about that. Mm -hmm. um, the, the first is when are these histories recorded? And I started to record oral histories in the mid-1980s. And it turned out that that was the sw a sweet spot for recording the oral histories of then adult child survivors because they were, they were finished with being busy with the business of, of building up their lives. They were finished with the business of raising small children. They were, they were moving into the grandparent phase. Um, but also, age had not yet put its hand on them. So their memories were sharp. And also, there wasn't a whole lot of visual material. I'm going to return to that in a minute. There wasn't a whole lot of visual material to shape their memories. So, and also, I was the first, in many, many cases, the first person to whom they related their histories as histories, as opposed to anecdotes, which they might have mentioned to their spouses or children or friends. So, there's this woman named Rina Finder who was um, who was a Schindler 
She was she was a, a so-called Schindler Jew. She was saved by Schindler. In the first record, I did not record her oral history. I have heard her oral history. Her first recordings, her first two recordings of her oral history done before Schindler's List came out are quite different from her, the history that she then told after the movie came out, especially like 10 years after the movie. And then by 20 years after the movie, her history had become the movie. So I was lucky. I, as I say, I just hit that right historical moment when the now adult child survivors were ready to remember and had memory to do so. Another piece is that I always look for triangulation of evidence. So when people said, we went from here to the Kunhegesh to Sarali to here to there, I then would check to see whether, in fact, there was such a short term ghetto there in, in printed documents. So I was looking for, as I say, this triangulation of evidence. But now I want to sidebar onto that question of triangulation of evidence. When the International Tracing Service, the ITS archive opened, the Bod Arlson archive opened, I searched whatever I could find about my aunt, this, the woman I told you about. And I found her paper, that, her intake paper, that was taken by a uh, so by social workers. Everybody had such an intake form, and it was filled out by social workers. And I saw that contrary to the history I had always heard from my aunt, that she was in Lodge Ghetto until the summer of 1944, and that then she was deported to Auschwitz when, the, when Lodge Ghetto was liquidated during that summer. Contrary to that, on the intake form, it said that she was deported to Auschwitz in 1942, two years earlier. I had a sleepless night. Had I misheard my aunt? Had she told it to me differently? Had she told her history differently for some reason? What could that be? My aunt had died by, the, by that point. I asked my mother. My mother said, no, so far as I know, no. Anyway, my mother's relationship to historical fact is loosey-goosey. My aunt's relationship to historical fact was quite different. So if this had been my mother's intake papers, I wouldn't have been so surprised. But my aunt, it didn't make sense. So I, as I say, I had this sleepless night, like totally sleepless night. And then I woke up the next morning and I said, you know what? I actually know how to research this. I can find out. And of course, when I did do my due diligence as a historian, I found, I found out that it, the oral history that my aunt told was correct, and this 1942 was not. So the question was, why did my aunt tell the social worker that she was deported in 1942? And what I surmise, this is really, I'm really off the reservation now. I'm just chatting to you. What I surmise is that she figured that the social worker had no idea 
that Lodge Ghetto was a forced labor camp. And so she was code switching. She was translating for her and said, for you to understand what my experience was, I was in Auschwitz. I surmise that. We will never know. Maybe it was just a typo. Maybe the social worker just wrote the wrong date. But I say all of that to tell you that unlike traditional historian creed, that the written record is more accurate than the oral record, I say, don't be so sure. Hmm. <laughs> well, I have, I have wrestled with uh, this dilemma we have at the institution here um, when we produce the exhibition. Um, uh, if um, the ones that survive can um, be representative for the millions that were killed or murdered and uh, um, whose voices we never will or get to hear, um, what's your opinion around that? Uh, that um, we don't have, we have the voices of the ones who survived when we talk about children during the Holocaust, but not the murdered ones. I say, thank goodness we have the voices we have. Mm -hmm. And that those voices at least open the door for us. I actually think that those who survived are representative of those who died until the moment of their death. Very thoughtful. Thank you for that answer. Um, you were uh, with <clears throat> your book, Children with a Star, you were um, like you, as you said before, one of the first scholars who began examining um, the fate of the children. Uh, if you look upon the Holocaust studies today, so what progress has been made since you started? Um, could you elaborate around that? To how? Oh, yes. Um, now, if you go to a conference on Holocaust history or genocide studies, there will be at least one panel dealing with the experiences of children. There will be at least one panel on rescue attempts. We glory when rescue was actually effective, when it worked. But attempts, too, are key. Um, now, when you go to such a conference, there will be at least one panel on the experiences of women. And at most conferences, not all, but at most, the idea of weaponizing sexuality will be present as well. So would you say that scholars of today are um, more keen to see the child, not the adult um, view? I wouldn't say that they are, that they focus on the child as, as opposed to the adults, but I would say that they have a wider lens and they train that lens on different groups. Okay. So, uh, around this topic, are there more to know? Are there more um, research and other ar archival material that we haven't seen yet, uh, yet to be found? I find it's endless. Mm. And in a way, we end where we began, if this is the end. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Mm. Um, but if it is, then I go back to my great appreciation that you have included the Roma and Sinti, because there's a huge amount of work to be done 
there. We have much to learn. Mm. Well, I have one more question. Maybe we, we have some time for questions from the audience as well. But um, I know you have the, the upcoming book, Saint and Liars, but you also have, uh, you're writing yet another book, and that's, uh, it's called Dear Tant Elizabeth. Um, and uh, very interesting, because that material, uh, you could maybe um, so explain a bit. Um. There was a woman named, uh, there was a woman named Elizabeth Lutz. She was a middle-aged lady who lived in Steffa, Switzerland, outside of Zurich. And to the best that I can piece together, she came to serve as a kind of mailbox for children, Jewish children who were separated from their parents um, during the uh, during the Nazi era, first because they went on kinder transport, so that's before the war, and then during the wartime. So what happened, the, to the best that I can figure out, what happened was that there was a um, a camp for Jewish men who had entered Switzerland illegally as refugees, and the Swiss put them into this camp. It was not a harsh camp, but nor were they free to go. And some of these men, a few of these men, asked this woman, Elizabeth Lutz, if she could help them by sending letters to their loved ones at home in greater Germany. And thus began her um, function as an intermediary. So parents sent their children, they thought, to safety on the kinder transports. They sent them to England, France, um, the Netherlands. Some came here to Stockholm. Um, in in most in many countries in Belgium, France, the Germans caught up with the children later, but the parents didn't know that at the time. So anyway, where I'm going with this is the parents were in Greater Germany. The children they thought were sent to safety, but then in the tangle of wartime postal regulations. They couldn't communicate with each other. So mail went through Switzerland. And what Tanta Elizabeth did was she got a letter from the parents. She copied the letter, keeping the original, and sent the copy on to the children. And the children wrote back to her asking her to please send on their letters to their parents. She copied the letter, sent on the copy. So, it, so what I have is the bilateral correspondence, like a thousand letters, written by children to their parents and parents to the children. Now, as people lost touch with each other, they, she, Tanta Elizabeth became the confidant, the confidant to the children and the confidant to the parents. So what do these letters tell us? What happens when children are separated? What do they talk about? What do they tell each other? And to give you some headlines, what I have found is that at the beginning, parents are eager to remind their children of all kinds of details. And the children are eager to fill their parents in on the details of their lives. They try to describe what the new school is like. They try to describe what their dormitory room looks like if they're in a, in a group home. You're with me so far? So they try to 
fill in the white spots of a canvas of each other's knowledge about the other. As time goes on and the situation deteriorates, people fall silent to self-censorship. As one mother wrote, why should I burden you? And then come just expressions of love and loyalty, of trying to, to hold on. And finally, neither the parents nor the children cared what the other one said, but letters became truly a sign of life, which in all too many cases was not the case. The children's drawings, the children drew to Tanta Elizabeth. So I have, so these letters have all these children's drawings. And she lived, as I say, outside of Switzerland, outside of Zurich in this small town. And I swear to you, I think she denuded the Alps of Edelweiss, because her, she would enclose some flowers into the letters she sent. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, do you have any questions in the audience? Uh, we have time left for anyone? Thank you very much. It has been very interesting to listen to you. Uh, my name is Klaus Ohmark, and I am an historian here in Sweden. I was a professor at Stockholm University. I was uh, listen, listening closely to what you said about interviews. I should say I am a bit more of a traditional historian than you because I prefer written records, at least the written records published or produced uh, at the time of events, like protocols or things like that. Uh, and what I do, if I intend to use interviews, I start to make myself a structure of events, of a process of events. And then I can see if a person I'm in, or if I'm reading an interview, very many interviews now, I can see is what this person tells us, was it possible in that structure? Or sometimes the answer is yes, and sometimes it's no. And then there is, there is another problem which I met and don't know exactly how to handle. Uh, there are now a number of uh, survivors who told their stories. And uh, sometimes you can find that what, something what they tell is not true. Should I publish that fact or not? Yeah, I can have an example here, for example. It was uh, a man named Jan Karski. He was a Polish uh, resistance fighter in the autumn of 1942. He was sent from Warsaw to London, a long journey, but he succeeded. And he came to London, I think it's November 1942. There are lots of documents from the Polish resistance uh, and about the Holocaust in Poland. But the Polish resistance movement had realized that what we told was not believed uh, in London or by the Polish exile government in London. So Karski said, he claimed that he had been in the uh, Holocaust camp called Belzec. And he told about Belzec. And when I read his story about Belzec, I know one thing, he had never been in Belzec. Should we say that or should we not say that? Should we, for example, or uh, how should we interpret this? Was he lying or what was it about? I think it was that he, he wanted to claim that he was an eyewitness of those kind of, of camps and he had information about different camps and he constructed the story. But, you know, there are many people in Sweden and other countries who are denying the Holocaust. And if they 
find out that one of those uh, imp important uh, storytellers are giving, are lying, or uh, what we say was not true, they will use it. <coughs> they will use it very much, and that is a problem and a danger. So uh, I think it's a problem for us as historians to think over what should we publish. Thank you. I think that you have answered your own question, but <laughs> I may also say that the Jan Karski, that ship has sailed because it is, it is now very well known and accepted that Jan Karski, who was an incredibly courageous and moral person, um, didn't go to Belzec. And I think, and most historians who have worked specifically on this tale of Jan Karski think exactly as you say, sir, that it was a way for him to validate, to underscore the urgency of the message he sought to bring. He never knew that he, that doing so would boomerang 40 years later with deniers. Hi, uh, my name is Bjorn, and uh, uh, maybe I'm drifting a little bit from the main topic, but I've always been wondering about this. I wonder, during the Second World War, did the U.S. authorities, the politicians and the rich people there, the people with power, did they know about this Jew persecution in Germany and Europe? Or did they find out afterwards? Maybe you don't know the answer to that either, but I've always been wondering that. So, thank you. If I understand correctly, your question is whether people who were wealthy and had um, business connections or the networks? Polit the politicians, mainly. The, the Jewish who, or non-Jewish? Uh, or doesn't matter? I, I would, my, the politicians making decisions in the United States during the war, I wouldn't know whether they were Jewish or not, but the people in power, so to speak, in the USA during the war. Did they know? Did they know? Or when did they know? So there's, I think that there's, um, at a certain point, there's a difference between information and knowledge. And certainly, at a certain point, government, US government officials, English government officials, the public record office files are full with this, um, knew, had information about what was happening. But I do believe that they did not have knowledge. I do believe that it was so outlandish that these, how do we imagine something which has never existed before? How do we, how can we imagine that? So alas, we do not have that excuse any longer. Now we can imagine only too well what genocide looks like. But at that time, I, think, I do believe that they had, at a certain point, they had information. And they didn't even know whether to trust that information. But they surely were, had not transmuted those facts of that knowledge, that information into knowledge. Do we have, we have another question over there? Yes, please. No. It's on, yes. Now I just want to comment on uh, uh, when you said that you, 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 it's good to trust the, you, you don't have to trust the, the written sources because uh, um, 
there are so many secrets and uh, people have they've hidden so much and there was such a when I came for an example I came to to Ravensbrück uh, to um, uh, in the mm, traces of my mother in uh, law and uh, uh, she was a survivor <laughs> and in the death book you had her name so <laughs> she was uh, it's it's just one example, and I have a lot of examples because they have changed their birth, I mean birth dates. They have changed their both of my parents in law because they, I mean, it was necessary. But um, much later, it came up in in books in Poland, uh, and uh, she's she was already dead then. But the truth is, it's so complicated, and it's such a complicated time. So. Like Karski, it's it's another example, uh, in a way. Yeah, it is. And just one, just to suggest to you, to hint to you, protocols which you mentioned. Think about how staff evaluations are written nowadays. You're writing a staff evaluation thinking about the sensibilities of many people involved. The staff person, that person's supervisor, maybe a board that oversees. Well, the same applies to protocols. Protocols are written to an audience. So I just wanted to raise this as a interesting perspective. Well, we'll come to the end of this talk and uh, your presentation and, and your presence here today has been lovely and we had a, a nice talk. And, and uh, before we end, I'd like to, to um, from the institution, the Living History Forum, I'd like to produce you with this uh, writing book for future projects. And in Swedish it says, history writes now, you are part of it. So oh, thank you very much, thank Deborah. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you to all of you here and to those at home. Thank you.